All right, before I continue this teaching, um, actually, it seems like there were a good number of Seventh-day Adventists who watched our previous video. Amen. And uh, even those who disagreed with me, I was actually kind of pleased to see, I was pretty pleased to see how they were still supportive of our ministry on what we did. Amen. So they are watching us. I pray that one day the Lord will soften your heart and open you up to Bible-believing truth. There are others who are obviously upset at me and other people who got upset of my sarcasm, obviously. So I hope the people, again, let me repeat again, I hope people understand that the sarcasm and criticism is aimed toward such leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist religion because they just corrupted people, so many people's minds with wrong doctrine. So the people who watch us online and are getting blessed, I don't have anything against you. I pray that the Lord will soften your heart and lead you to truth. But I do not have, I told you over and over again, and I am not going to compromise on this no matter what. And I believe that's the reason why the Lord blessed our ministry. Because I made this promise a long time ago. I will not water down on exposing people who corrupt souls and people's minds on Bible-believing doctrine, especially salvation. Amen. Especially when you use your intellectual garb on me, I'm going to make you look like a fool. That's what I'm going to do. Because the Bible says that the foolishness of God is even wiser than the wisdom of men. Right. And I want to make that plain. Okay, let's do this, shall we? All right, let's cover Seventh-day Adventism. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 56, please. Isaiah chapter 56, and we will read verse 2. Isaiah chapter 56. And then we will read verse 2. Now, this is a passage that is used among Seventh-day Adventists that the Sabbath is not only for the Jews. That's how we argue, remember? So we try to argue that the Sabbath is something under the Mosaic law for Jews. Last Bible study, we debunked the notion that no, the Sabbath is something that was universal before the law of Moses. We debunked that completely. Now we're going to debunk this notion that the Sabbath can be applied to Gentiles. That's what they're going to try to claim. So the SDA, they claim that it was for the Gentiles. This is their claim. Whereas the Christians, we argue that this one was done for Jews in the Mosaic Law. Here's their proof text. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. So these are eunuchs. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. So notice right here that this is not just the Jews. You're also going to notice that at verse mm, 3, Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people, the Jews. Neither let the eunuchs say, Behold, I am a dry tree. So notice that eunuchs and strangers in this context, that these are referring to Gentiles. Now, that's their proof text right here. So the Seventh-day Adventists, they're going to claim that these Gentiles, who are eunuchs and strangers, they can't say, I'm separated from God and from his people. No, because if you look at verse 6, they're also supposed to keep the Sabbath too. So how do you argue against this? The Seventh-day Adventists seem to have an advantage. The simple answer is they don't look at the whole context here. Read verses 2 through 7. The whole context here, that's why dispensationalism is so important. Dispensationalism, we recognize that Gentiles will observe the observances of the Mosaic Law. Why? 
because it will be at the timeline of the millennium when the nation of Israel is restored. That's a future kingdom of God. Future kingdom of God long ahead of today, after the tribulation. Verse 2, Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. We read 3 and 4. The Gentiles, they seem to be separated from God's chosen people. But God invites them, because at verse 5, even unto them will I give in what? Mine house and within my walls, a place and a name better than of sons and, and of daughters, and I will give them a what? Everlasting. Everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Obviously, that has not happened yet. They did not get a name from God that's eternal. They did not come to a place where it is in God's house. There's only one time period you can think of if that did not happen today or the previous millennia, the only time period you can fit it in is the millennium. See, it's a future kingdom. Verse 7, even then will I bring to my what? Holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Now, if the SDA, Seventh-day Adventist, claims that this is applied to Gentiles today, they all should go take pilgrimages to the nation of Israel to God's house in Jerusalem. Obviously, that does not apply. Why? Because God's house is no longer Jerusalem today. That's not available today. That's happening at the millennium. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. We're not doing that today. But obviously, sacrifices will be reinstated at the future kingdom. Verse 8 is utmost proof. The Lord God which gathereth the what? Outcasts of Israel. See, the context is the restoration of the nation of Israel, where God's kingdom rules over them. Let's also look at verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye, ju uh, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my what? Salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. See, look at the future context right here. This future context is when he brings salvation and reveals his righteousness upon the whole world. And the whole world, they're going to have to do sacrifices, go to his temple and house. That obviously did not happen today or the previous millennia with the Gentiles. The only time period is the millennium. Let's also look at verse, uh, chapter 66. They did not read this. Look at chapter 66. Read verse 22 through 23, chapter 66, verses 22 through 23. Look at the time period. It is the time period of the new kingdom that God sets up. When the old systems of the world pass away and they are gone. So notice it's a future context millennium. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. See, that's the time period. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from what? One Sabbath to another shall what? All flesh come to worship before me. There is your context, the same book Isaiah. People coming to God's house to worship, doing sacrifices. What time period? Verse 22 told you it's the new system of God's kingdom. Verse 22. That's why verse 23, all flesh, the entire world, the Gentiles, will come to worship him. Now look at verse 24. This did not happen at verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Look at that. Notice hell. If they don't observe the Sabbath, the, all of them will see hell opened up right in front of their eyes. That obviously never happened the past millennia or today. This is God's future kingdom. By the way, this is a nice verse to show to the Seventh-day Adventists that there is eternal hell fire, right. which they do not believe. They believe more in annihilation. And then there's a few fragments out there who believes in Satan being the scapegoat. Now, I had a lot of Seventh-day Adventists mad at me saying, we don't believe in that, we don't believe in that. The reason why is because your church does not show you all the teachings of Ellen G. White. There are some things that you shy away from. Not only that, 
you don't keep track of all Seventh-day Adventists out there. There were some that I would come across who believe in a universal, universal salvation, that even Satan took upon the lost people's sin. So see, the thing is this, is that these people, they're only concentrated in their own group of Seventh-day Adventists in a local area. They did not read their writings. They did not read the entire church system. And I just posted a comment underneath some of these people. Ellen G. White's famous book, which you all should know, The Great Controversy. She even said that, Satan's a scapegoat. I put it on my previous video. I answered the comments. I responded. So if you're all curious, you can look that up too. You'll see my response to those comments. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 4 through 10. Another passage that supposedly proves that everyone has to observe the Sabbath. It's not Jews. So remember, Seventh-day Adventists, they keep insisting this. So the next verse that they're going to insist why it's Gentiles, we saw Isaiah 56. Their second passage is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. Hebrews 4, verses 4 through 10. <coughs> the word of God reads right here, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So notice that God rested from the seventh day all his works, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. See, they did not believe, so they do not observe his rest of the Sabbath, so to speak. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. See, so you're hardening your heart, you're not observing the Sabbath. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? See, Jesus even talks about the Sabbath. There remaineth therefore a rest, the Sabbath to who? The people of God. So see, we Christians should observe it. It's not just Jews. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. So like God rested on the Sabbath, so should God's people, the Christians. Now, the simple answer to that is this. Look at the title of your book. There's your answer. So they just weren't paying attention. So notice that when it's talking about the people of God here, it's referring to Jews again. See that? There's your answer, Hebrews. By the way, look at the time period as well. You're also going to notice at chapter 1, verse 2, look at chapter 1, verse 2. Think about it. Why is it to Jews in the future time period? Because, uh-oh, remember the previous passage? Millennium. Remember, God's going to restore the nation of Israel. God is going to reinstate the sacrifices and the Mosaic law system. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hath in these what? Last days spoken unto us by his Son. So notice that the author of Hebrews warned you that as I introduce this book, it's going to be talking about last days. Look at chapter, we're going to look at chapter 2, verse 5. Chapter 2, verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. See, the author of Hebrews saying we're speaking about this future world that God's going to set up. Not the old world system today, when God sets up his new world system with his kingdom. Look at chapter 8, verse 10. Chapter 8, verse 10. Look at this passage right here. Notice that the nation of Israel becomes restored with a brand new covenant under God's new kingdom system. Chapter 8, verse 10. For this is a covenant that I will make with the who... House of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a what? People. Remember Hebrews 4? People of God. See, this is referring to the Jews. Verse 11. 
and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. See, this definitely does not apply to Christians because we Christians today are supposed to tell people to know the Lord. But why is it in this verse you're not supposed to tell people to know the Lord? It's so obvious. God is ruling all over the world. They know who he is. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So we see right here, this is proof. It's referring to the millennium. Now let's also look at Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. Now here's a verse that you want to mark down. Now I gave you Nehemiah chapter 9, remember? That was a, probably a really good passage to debunk Seventh-day Adventists showing them that it does apply to Jews and it started with Moses. It wasn't before. I'm going to give you another passage that proves this is for Jews. Look at Exodus chapter 31 verse 13. So let's prove that this is the Mosaic law for Jews. Exodus chapter 31. And then we'll read verse 13 and verses 16 through 17. Verses 16 through 17. The Bible says right here, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout what? Your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. See, this is for the generations as it passed down, for the Jews. Let's also notice that verse 13 says it's a sign. The Sabbath, why was the Sabbath started? Because it's a sign between me and you. Not a sign for Ellen G. White or the Seventh day Adventists. That's right. Let's keep reading right here. We're going to read verse 16. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. See, it is a perpetual, long-lasting, everlasting covenant between God and his people. You can't just insert some Gentile in there and then steal it away from God's people, the Jews. Right. No, this is something perpetual between them and God, not you. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel for how long? Forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So notice when the Seventh-day Adventist friends of yours start to pull up Genesis 2, that notice that God sanctified and rested on the Sabbath. Yeah, but it, it never said that it was applied to the Gentiles. It just simply said to God, the Seventh-day meant a lot to him which is very true if you study number seven and seventh day throughout your Bible, it is very important to God. Right. But in that passage, it never said he gave it as a commandment for Gentiles. And when God kept that Sabbath day in his mind, this was very important to me, who did he give that command to? Not to Gentiles, but at verse 17, to Jews. So you use that verse on the seventh day event as if they try to use Genesis 2 on you. Okay, let's also look at Ezekiel chapter 20. Here's a really good one, Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. The Word of God shows every single time that the Sabbath is something for the Mosaic law system only for Jews, the nation of Israel. This does not apply to Christians today. This is for God's chosen people, the Jews. Now, that's why if you want to support replacement theology... Replacement theology, again, teaches that Christians are the nation of Israel. We replace them. Then notice right here that you got a problem then. So then you're going to have to say that you're going to have to observe the Sabbath because it is a perpetual covenant between, between God's chosen people. It cannot be broken. But guess what? Seventh-day Adventists, they would love replacement theology. So people who claim that they are King James only, independent, fundamental, Baptist, and we're a brand new form of IFB, these guys are cults, yep. just like Seventh-day Adventists. And if I were you, I'd be so terrified of them that I'd unsubscribe from all of their channels, not watch amen, them again. Amen. This is a downward hill toward cults. You notice that. All right, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20. And hallow my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between what? Me and you, he's speaking to the Jews here, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God, 
who requires a sign. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So notice that Sabbaths are constantly a sign. A sign, a sign, a sign. But Christians, we don't seek after signs. Our faith is not founded upon what we see or some kind of sign. See, something visible. It is, our faith is founded upon the word of God. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. There's a distinction with Gentiles and Jews here. Gentiles and Jews. For the Jews require a sign. See? Sabbaths are for them. But, but the Greeks seek after what? Wisdom. See that? Gentiles are totally different. So notice right here that this is very different from them. But look at us. Verse 24, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the what? Wisdom of God. So then Gentiles seek after wisdom. And then notice right here that if you're a saved Christian, then what happens is your wisdom is what? It's Jesus Christ. It's not the Sabbath, it's Jesus Christ. Now what's very interesting is that, just something real quick, some people might be wondering, well, I'm a Jew, but I receive Christ for my salvation, I'm a saved Christian. So does that mean I have to observe the Sabbath? No, because at verse 24, notice that it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. If you're saved, if you're a saved Christian, you're distinguished from a Gentile and a Jew. God considers you a saved Christian, the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at the last verse over there when you have spare time. There's a distinction with God's church and the Jews and the Gentiles. So we all become saved Christians. All right, let's also look at Romans chapter 14. Here are the top three popular verses that Seventh-day Adventists know. And th these are popular verses you want to know. Popular verses debunking the Sabbath is Romans chapter 14, 5, and 6. So here are your top three, so to speak. The top three are Romans chapter 14, verses 5 through 6. Let me know if I'm out of bounds. Romans chapter 14, verses 5 through 6. The second one is Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. And then the third one that you want to write down, which is the best one, is Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 16. These are your top three verses that debunk the notion of Sabbath. This is proof that New Testament Christians do not observe the Sabbath today. This is proof that the Sabbath system is done away with. And it's not going to return until the future kingdom that God sets up with Israel. Why? Because God's not ruling over Israel now. God's focusing on the church. So because of that, that's why the Sabbaths, the Sabbath, excuse me, are done away with. They're gone. All right, look at Romans chapter 14, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth to the Lord eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. This verse is a thorn on the side of Seventh-day Adventism because it doesn't care about diet and days, which Seventh-day Adventists make a big deal of. They make a big deal out of diet and days. But the Bible says right here, Christians don't care about that. Let every man be fully persuaded in his or her own mind. Now look, there's nothing wrong. If you Christians want to get together and worship the Lord on a Saturday, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not against that. Days don't matter to the Lord. Now, I'm going to show you later on why we do Sundays and why we focus on that rather than Saturdays. I'll explain that later. But to be honest, days don't matter. Uh, diet don't even matter, too. Look, if you want to go ahead and eat that steak, eat your heart out, man. You love that chocolate, go eat your chocolate, man. If, you're gonna, if you want to eat that vegetable, go eat your vegetable, man. During that buffet line at Sunday, if you want to skip all that unhealthy fatty food and just take a salad man be like brother brent man sit at a corner you know and then be all healthy okay who cares man serve the lord the best way you can now look at galatians chapter 4 galatians chapter 4 
We're going to look at verses 9 through 10. So because I've writ written them out, I'm just going to go far away, okay? So here we go. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Somebody's returning to bondage, slavery, to something weak and beggarly. What is that? Verse 10. Ye observe days and months and times and years. Look at that. Observing days. Let's look at Colossians 2.14. This is the number one verse. All right, I'm going to read it real quick. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to a, his cross. Notice Jesus Christ got rid of the Mosaic law when he died on the cross. Whoa. See, that is your proof text that the Sabbath, the Mosaic law is done. Keep reading here. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you. See, don't let anyone tell you what to do. If you hear the Seventh-day Adventist speaker telling you, judge you in what? Meat? Oh, don't eat that meat. Didn't you know that it's blah? See, that Seventh-day Adventist shoving that diet on you. Or in drink. See, those are Seventh-day Adventists shoving that diet on you. Or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Look at that. This verse is perfectly picturing your Seventh-day Adventist friends. God says, no, no. And guess what? No. <laughs> well, I, there's no way to argue against this. It's scripture. Now, if that's not enough, look at Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31, verse 15. Exodus 31, verse 15. If we want to reinstate the Mosaic law, then don't pick and choose. That's right. This is how you're going to catch those Seventh-day Adventists. If they keep insisting that we have to observe the Mosaic law system, then they're going to have some problems here. Look at Exodus. Uh, I'm going to do the forbidden color. Uh, oh, it doesn't work. Maybe the Lord doesn't want me to use it. Okay. <laughs> All righty then, Exodus chapter 31, verse 15. <clears throat> the first time the pastor was wrong, you know, and the church member was right, you know. <laughs> Exodus chapter 31, verse 15. All right. Seventh-day Adventists, they will insist that Sabbath days, they, will, they are continuing today. If they want to do that, then... Show them this verse, verse 15. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh, day, seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. And then your Seventh-day Adventist friend will go, yeah, that's right. I told you, sir, we got to observe it. Oh, really? Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Okay, if you break the Sabbath and Seventh-day Adventist insists you have to observe the Sabbath, then the Bible says that you're supposed to drop dead. So you're supposed to be killed. That's what happens. So you know what the Sabbath day is? The Sabbath day right here, what it is, is that <laughs> you're supposed to drop dead. If you break it, you die. Amen. You're, not only that, you're supposed to be stoned to death. Yes, sir. Now, what Seventh-day Adventists, this is their favorite catchphrase. They're going to say, well, this is a ceremonial law. There's a distinction with ceremonial and moral laws. That's how Seventh-day Adventists go around this. Now, remember, I keep telling you so many times over and over again, is that Seventh-day Adventists, they will insert their own interpretation that is a plain truth. You notice that there is no verse that shows their wording the wording of their interpretation. Remember that in our last lesson? But it looked very persuasive, their interpretation, right? That's what Satan does. He makes sure that you don't pay attention to the actual words, as it says, that you don't pay attention to the full context, that you don't pay attention with Scripture interpreting Scripture. Where did it say that? They just inserted that for you. Now, when they keep saying this is a ceremonial law or an old tradition that has been changed, that they'll probably say that too. 
So they'll probably say, well, during the culture of that time, that's how they observe things. It's an old tradition. Okay, then what happens if somebody today don't observe the Sabbath? What's our new tradition? Well, we're not going to stone you, but I guess we're going to shoot you with a gun. Is, is that the difference, you know, with the tradition? Because cultures were different that time. Yeah. This is how we execute criminals. We don't stone them to death, you know. We'll hang them or shoot them with a gun or, you know, give them, uh, all, uh, give them the, the needle and, all, and the electric chair and all that kind of stuff. What, what are we going to do? Lethal injection? What? Okay. But here's their thing is that when they keep inserting this, then what you need to do is you point out to them that you made man the final authority in picking and choosing which verse because this is one and the same verse. They, they deliberately, they biasly selected. This part of the portion is mine, but the second half, no. Look at that. Look at that. Not only that, there is no scriptural evidence. Where is the scriptural evidence that this is an old tradition and an old ceremony that we don't observe anymore? See, there is nothing like that. By the way, how do you not know that this Sabbath day, if they insist that this part is ceremonial, then say this, this is the same verse. So I guess the Sabbath is ceremonial then that we don't observe. It's an old tradition we don't observe. Exactly. I've been telling you that over and over again. Why won't you listen to me? No, that's not what I meant. And they'll shoot off their mouth. That's what Seventh-day Adventists always do. Look at Numbers 15. Numbers 15. If they still insist that we got to observe the Sabbath, then look what every Seventh-day Adventist is guilty of doing. This is what every Seventh-day Adventist is guilty of doing. What you're going to find out is that if you break the Sabbath day, in Numbers chapter 15, you're not even supposed to do something as small as this, 32 through 36. How many of us have been guilty of doing this? Then we would have all died. Verse 32, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. 34, they put him in prison. Verse 35, he was supposed to be put to death. Verse 36, they indeed put him to death. Look at that. <laughs> You're supposed to be put to death if you just pick up something from the ground. By the way, there's even a verse that even if you light a fire, you're supposed to be put to death. So how many of you just lighted up a fire, you know, on Saturday before? Oh, you're all supposed to die. Turn on a stove, you know. Uh, Got to eat something for fellowship, Seventh-day Adventist church. We're going to have, a, you know, a big potluck dinner, you know. Let's all turn on the stove, you know. Death, 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 death. Look at that. Now look at Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35. Here's the verse that you're not even supposed to kindle a fire, see. Look at Exodus 35. You're not even supposed to kindle a fire. Exodus chapter 35, verse 3. <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> We're in trouble. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Whoa. Whoa. How many of them have uh, turned on the lights, turned on the fire, turned up the stove, turned up the heat? Look, be honest, man. Be honest. Well, that was uh, for them, but not for us today, you know. Well, I guess, <laughs> oh, those poor people, I guess, if, if only they had an electric heater like you did, an electric light like you did, then I guess that's the, that's the way they can slide around that law, right? See, that's so ridiculous. This is so ridiculous. This is obviously talking about a universal passage, if you want to make a universal, we're supposed to keep the Sabbath. God deliberately did not want you to do anything practically. Even like some small little errand. In church at Sunday, we worship the Lord, but we always have some small errands we run, right? Those SDA churches, everyone's got an errand to do, I bet you. And you know what? When they did that, they broke the Sabbath, and they're supposed to be put to death according to the Old Testament law. Uh-oh is right. Okay, so if you see your Seventh-day Adventist loved one or some Seventh-day Adventist doing any kind of errand in church, you tell them this. 
you just broke the Sabbath. You tell them that. Aren't you supposed to observe the Sabbath? You, I'm serious. That way they can start thinking here. Yeah. Because they keep accusing you for not observing the Sabbath, that you're the one breaking the Sabbath. Now it's time to turn the tables on them. How many of them have lighted up their engines, you know, vroom, 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 got to go to church. Oh, oh everyone broke the law right there. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is even more ridiculous. I don't know if Seventh-day Adventists know this. How many of them shaved before they went to church on the Sabbath? How many of them polished their shoes before they went to church on the Sabbath? Didn't you know you're not supposed to do that? You know who taught that? Not the Bible. Ellen G. White, your founder. Ellen G. White. Okay, her article is Home Training. It's important and results. Found in her magazine, Signs of the Times, May 25th, 1882. She says, the violation of the fourth commandment is not confined to the preparation of food. Many carelessly put off blacking their boots and shaving until after the beginning of the Sabbath. This should not be. If any neglect to do such work on a working day, they should have respect enough for God's holy time to let their beards remain unshaven, their boots rough and brown until the Sabbath is passed. This might help their memory. No, I don't think they remember Ellen G. White. They all forgot this. This might help their memory and make them more careful to do their own work on the six working days. <laughs> now, Seventh-day Adventists, they'll deny this part, what I'm about to say. But guess what? Online, I've seen so many of them saying this. They're resurrecting this teaching now. So generally, SDA churches don't try not to teach this anymore. They've, they keep changing rules. They yeah. keep amending their rules. So they try to word it differently now. So, but if you're going to be totally honest or rich, your founder, if you believe she's inspired, then you should amend. Your founder believed that observing Sunday is receiving 666, the mark of the beast. So I guess we're all part of the Antichrist system and we're going to hell. Quote, But when Sunday observeth shall be enforced by law, and the world shall be enlightened concerning the obligation of the true Sabbath, then whoever shall transgress the command of God to obey a precept which has no higher authority than that of Rome will thereby honor popery above God. He is paying homage to Rome and to the power which enforces the institution ordained by Rome. He is worshiping the beast and his image. As men then reject the institution which God hath declared to be the sign of his authority and honor in its stead that which Rome has chosen as a token of her supremacy, they will thereby accept the sign of allegiance to Rome, the mark of the beast. Ha, ha, and ha. <laughs> this is founded in her popular book, The Great Controversy. This is in the Pacific Press Publish Publishing Association, printed by them, 2002, page 449. Here's another one. This is found in Seventh-day Adventists Believe a Biblical Exposition of 27 Fundamental Doctrines. This is founded by their Ministerial Association General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. This is their public, this is their official committee, okay? Date is 1988, page 263. Quote, the delivering of this message will precipitate a conflict that will involve the whole world. The central issue will be obedience to God's law and the observance of the Sabbath. In the face of this conflict, everyone must decide whether to keep God's commandments or those of men. This message will produce a people who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Those who reject it will eventually receive the mark of the beast. So if you reject the Sabbath and Moses' law, then you are going to worship the Antichrist and his 666 system. That's what they claim. If you go to church on Sunday, you will observe and worship the, Santa, the Antichrist. I almost said Santa Claus. The Antichrist <laughs> and his beast system. Not much difference, though. Satan Claus, you know, with the Antichrist. But anyway, aside from that, that's another teaching. Now, Seventh-day Adventists... They're going to argue this, is that we don't teach this. We simply believe that one day the Antichrist will do that. We're not saying it right now. It's just one day in the future where that's what's going to happen. But look, this does not change the fact that let's say the Antichrist is already here and now. 
and he made that law here and now, it doesn't change the fact that I have the mark of the beast, if we're going to put it that way. If some ruler told me to worship my Christian God in church at Sunday, then you got to realize this, is that there's nothing wrong with doing that. But see, to those people's mind, they think, oh, you're observing the Antichrist and his system. No, it's not. Who cares? Because God says it doesn't matter which day you observe and worship. We, we read those verses. But you got to realize this. Obviously, that is not going to happen. Why? Because the beast is going to persecute the saints at Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. So notice right here that here, a saved child of God recognizes from the Bible that Sabbath observance is not available. And if the Antichrist were to set it up right now with his government and his system... Will I be taking the mark of the beast? No, because Revelation chapter 13, verse 7 shows the opposite. That the saved children of God, that they will be contrary to the Antichrist. They do not take the mark of the beast. So this mark of the beast is not Sunday observant. If you read Revelation 13, what the mark of the beast is, it's something that you have to use to buy or sell. Not Sunday church. Where did you get that idea from? Fantasy, la la land. That's right. What if I said, didn't you know the Antichrist is going to teach about observing the Sabbath? That's the mark of the beast. Hey. hey, what's the difference right here? I'm just interpreting like you are. I'm just taking something out of thin air, making la la land interpretations. You might say, no, it doesn't. Why? Use your head. Start getting, stop, stop getting emotional and sensitive. Don't let feelings overrun you. Use your brain and think. Why am I wrong here, Seventh-day Adventist, sir? Because the Bible talks about God, do, uh, God telling the people to observe the Sabbath. So there's no way that's part of the Antichrist. Yes, just like God said about days don't matter on what day you worship, and that Paul, uh, uh, Paul met together with the church at Sunday as well. So obviously that's not part of the Antichrist system then, Sunday. Where'd you get this idea from? The idea, it's from the devil. Now, a lot of people, they're going to keep saying, well, this is something of a Catholic system. Oh, you know, my foot, all right? My foot, all right? The Catholics believe Jesus is God. Seventh-day Adventists, don't you believe Jesus is God? Well, that's a Catholic teaching. By the way, you know who's going to accuse you of that? Jehovah's Witnesses are going to accuse you, Seventh-day Adventists, of that. Did you know that's a Catholic teaching? You Seventh-day Adventists don't care, right? Why? Because it matters from the Scripture. It's just that Satan's system will copycat how God's people do things. So start using your heads, man. Okay, now let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And we're going to have to close it right here. So I'm going to close it right here. But we're going to now next cover a portion where... Seventh-day Adventists will claim that Jesus and the early church Christians observed the Sabbath. So then we Christians should be observing it too. So we'll cover that next week. Your homework assignment will be uh, how to witness to Buddhist. How to witness to Buddhist. I will put that video link below, uh, that video link below this video that I'm going to post. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have strengthened us more in Bible-believing truth, opened our eyes, and grown our knowledge more to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. 
If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.